Okay, for number two. The first thing we need to do is read the problem and tease out the information that we'll need to be able to work the rest of the problem. So we have two groups here, males and females. I'm just going to call them A and B. And we have sample sizes, sample means, and sample standard deviations for each. So in group A, females, we have a random sample of size 16, mean purchase level of 25, and a sample standard deviation of 6. We have 16 males, 22, and 4. So I'm going to get the variances, 36 and 16. And 36 is more than twice 16. That is greater than 16 times 2. So that means we have unpooled. So you will, to get degrees of freedom in this case, have to use your calculator. So go to two sample t-test, enter the numbers from the problem, these. Make sure you enter the standard deviation and not the variance when you do that. And you'll say unpooled. And let's see, we'll want to know if it's higher for one group than the other. So you'll select greater than when you get down to that part. And anyway, you're going to come up with a number that is if I remember right, let me look, it's 26 point something. Just lop off whatever the decimal is, always round down. So our degrees of freedom is going to be 26. Then I'm also going to go ahead now, I guess I can do this. For alpha 05 and a one-tailed test, we're also for a 90% confidence level. So I can go look up the appropriate t-value for that, and it's going to be 1.706. So you might want to make note of that. That is going to be the critical value for the t-test. It's also going to be the confidence coefficient for the confidence interval. That's because this is one-tailed alpha equal to 0.05 and 26 degrees of freedom. Of course, you could just look under 90% confidence, and you're going to get the same thing. I'm going to go ahead also and calculate here the standard error. And that's equal to S squared A over NA. I should note here, I will note, that the reason we're going to use the calculator to get this number is it's just a very long formula to get it. It's something called the Seder-Waith approximation. And um, I don't think it will add to your real understanding of uh, statistics to go through that formula. So we'll just use the calculator for that. You can note some similarities here. If you took the square root of each of these terms, you would have S squared A over the square root of NA and so on, uh, which looks a lot like the standard error. What we are doing is taking the, basically combining the standard errors for both A and B, or for both groups A and B. So it actually looks a little bit more like the standard error that we computed before. So we take the variance. Now this is the 36 divided by the sample size for that group plus the variance of the second group divided by its sample size, and that comes out to be 1.80. So we'll need to keep these numbers and this idea, and we get those simply by knowing whether or not the variances should be pooled. A little bit more room here if I can. Oh, 
say for the sample sizes and comment on that, the sample sizes were each 16, which if you have 16, okay, come back to where I was there. If you have n is equal to 16, that's greater than or equal to 5. So if you have a normal population or skew, you can just proceed. If you have outliers or extreme values, you need a larger sample size or you just can't carry out the analysis, at least not using what I'll call the analyses that we'll do in this class. There are some analyses called non-parametric that are not as powerful as the methods we'll use in this class. But it does give you another option when you don't meet those characteristics. You'll just need to take a course in non-parametric statistics to get that. Okay, so that's A. B, right, the research and the uh, null hypothesis. The research hypothesis was mu A greater than mu B. And HO, the null hypothesis, the null hypothesis is that mu A is equal to mu B. Alternatively stated, mu A minus mu B is equal to zero. So using the degrees of freedom and everything, we already actually looked it up. For the critical value approach, I'm on to C now. We're going to reject the null hypothesis if T test is greater than 1.706. The T test is equal to the statistic X bar A minus X bar B minus the hypothesized parameter divided by the standard error. And all that's equal to 25 minus 22 minus 0 <coughs> over 1.8 over 1.8. Again, I want you to think of this as one number, so I'll go ahead and subtract it out there. The difference between the two sample means is 3. And I get 1.67, which is not greater than 1.706. So we fail to reject HO. And we conclude mu A could equal mu b. So that's part c. Move down to the part D, the sampling distribution. Well, the p-value in this case is got that from the calculator and I could have written it down back then. Um, that came with the calculations when we were going after the degrees of freedom. Uh, if you didn't write it down, if you want to see where it's at, go back and run the two sample t-test on your calculator again 
and you'll see that along with that degrees of freedom of 26 point whatever it was, there's a p-value there of 0.054. You can also note that the t-test value that you would get on your calculator is, or at least is very close to 1.67, which is what we just calculated. So uh, to draw the sampling distribution, delay here. It's got to be something with when I do my erasing. Well, anyway, mu A minus mu B is zero at the center. Uh, the difference that we observed was three. And this area here is the p-value of 0.054. So that's part D, and then we'll get over here to part E. The first part is test the hypothesis using the p-value. We're going to reject HO. P-value. is less than 0.05. The p-value is 0.054. That is not less than 0.05. So we fail to reject HO and conclude mu A could equal mu b, or that mu a minus mu b could be zero. Those are equivalent statements. This kind of points up one advantage of the p-value, and that is that if someone else came along and said, I'd be willing to accept an, a significance level of 0 0.10, then they could use your p-value to make a decision. Also, uh, you can note, even I'm cutting off at 0.05, and even though we technically with the critical value approach didn't reject HO, it's worth noting that we're pretty close to the level of rejection with 0.054 as, uh, as our p-value. So if HO is true if mu A is equal to mu B. That's equivalent to saying if mu A minus mu, that's equivalent to saying if mu A minus mu B is equal to zero. Could have said that either way. Then there is a 0 0.054 chance the difference between the two sample means, x bar A minus x bar B, is greater than or equal to three. Again, all I've done is put the picture over here into the form of a sentence. Okay, so for the confidence interval, once again we have, okay, that wasn't good, x bar A minus x bar B, not sure why that happened, 
plus or minus the confidence coefficient, which is T, times the standard error. Please ignore that little scratch that I put in there. Not sure what I was thinking, or maybe I just wasn't thinking there for a moment. 3 plus or minus 1.706 times 1.80, and that will be minus 0 0.07 to 6.071. So evaluating that, interpreting that in the, concept, in the context of this problem, the interval includes zero. Therefore, mu A could equal mu B. Again, as I said before, that interval includes a lot of numbers that are not zero. It could be any of those as well, but it could be zero. We could not reject that possibility.